You are listening to More Than a Sniff, a weekly podcast of Western States Canine College. I'm Joe, owner and principal trainer here with my colleagues, Chris, Michelle, and Shannon. Today, we are going to talk about... Hey, Catherine, how are you? Hey, Joe, how are you? Good, good, thanks. So I appreciate you sharing your book, um, and I've, I've been on your website, and... Um, so I have a ton of questions, but I first want you to kind of share your journey as a dog trainer um, and kind of where it all started and what was your drive to become a dog trainer, and, um, and then we'll get into the book. Okay. So um, how everything started, I was telling your husband that um, I think I was born with dogs on my brain, and I remember, like, begging my parents. I was the youngest of three girls please, can we get a dog, can we get a dog, can we get a dog? And I felt like I waited an eternity until I was in kindergarten when we finally got a dog. And I was so thrilled, but, you know, they were just the family pet kind of thing. And so when I started college, I uh, decided to go into zoology. And I was at Champaign-Urbana during the school year. And then I went back to uh, Chicago during the summers, and there, I, I don't know how I lucked into this, but I was able to get a keeper position at Brookfield Children's Zoo, and we had all these different educational programs, and one of them was a dog demonstration, sheep herding, tracking, obedience, service work, and I was selected to be a dog trainer. So when I was 18 years old, I was working at a job at the zoo, which I absolutely loved, and not only was I, you know, able to be a keeper and demonstrate, you know, uh, what do you call it, milking goats and cows and talking about animals, I was taught how to train dogs, and I demonstrated everything from sheep herding, tracking, service work, obedience, uh, retrieving, all kinds of stuff, and so... That really hooked me, and I got my very first dog when I was 19 and just became an addict. You know, we I'd go to work at the zoo, and then we'd track our dogs after work or retrieve them or whatever we were doing. And so when I started, I, I continued on in school, in graduate school, and I wasn't able, I did, you know, like the obedience ring, I did some obedience competition and tracking uh, trials and things like that, but then once grad school really took off, I couldn't really do that, but dogs were always, trained dogs were always just a staple of mine, Mm -hmm. and then um, about four or five years ago, I, I would often have people stop me and say, wow, could you train my dog, because they would see how my dogs were. And I said, I, I would be like, no, I'm really busy with school. I can't do that type of thing. And then about four years ago, someone asked me, so what do you think of Caesar Milan? And I said, I don't know who that is because I was oblivious to that stuff because I had started training when I was so young and I was exposed to so many different trainers through my upbringing. I had no idea who he was. So before I started my business, I read all his books, watched all his videos, watched Ian Dunbar, um, uh, Donaldson, Gene Donaldson, you know, everybody. I just wanted to know what was out there. Uh, because if I didn't, I mean, I just wanted to make sure I covered all the bases and, you know, and then it ended up, uh, like you saw in my book, I compare you know, the different philosophies, because I had a different philosophy of training that was, you know, a combination of my experience at the zoo and my training, academic training, and my teaching of people. So I just kind of fell up this whole thing. Sure. And then, um, so you started your business how long ago? Four years ago? I started in 2014. Okay. And, um, and as far as when what led to your book? So what led to my book was, like I said, when I started training, I really wanted to get a feel for 
all the different trainers, you know, and all I kept hearing about was, you know, there's just all these different techniques and so many different philosophies. And so, like I said, when I started, I really take on, I took it on almost like another dissertation mm-hmm. uh, where I just really wanted to understand all the research out there. And as I was looking at all these different trainers, I mean, yes, aside from Milan and uh, Ian Dunbar and all these other uh, very popular people, you see all these other folks, and they really fall into those two main categories of either being an aversive trainer or being a positive-only, positive reinforcement trainer. Mm-hmm. And there was very little in between, or at least people weren't espousing that at all. It was either positive-positive-only or you were on the other side. And they almost made it like the evil side, you know, so it was like the good and the bad. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the feel that I got from that. And so, and, you know, as I was training dogs, like I said, I really developed my own techniques, and I know that other people share those techniques, um, but, you know, we came about them differently because you're not really taught those. And I just wanted to, I just had this feel, this urge that I needed to explain that you can train differently, that you can train, you know, as you think like a dog. And so that was my point. You know, I've been studying dogs for so long, and so I really felt like it was really important for me to put it out there. And what um, what was your audience, or who was your audience in mind for your book? My audience that I really wanted to go for were dog owners, not necessarily trainers, but folks who are interested in training their dogs and are starting from scratch, or folks who have been frustrated. You know, the available techniques to them, they're either confused or they've tried a bunch of different training techniques, and it's just not working. And, you know, there's it's almost like there's an epidemic now of dogs in shelters. You know, just so many dogs getting surrendered. And I believe it's because of the inability to train them. And if they could find an easy way and a successful way to train these dogs, we wouldn't have this epidemic of all these abandoned dogs in shelters. What um, Have you worked in the shelter world at all? Not really. I help folks. I've worked with uh, owners of people people who have adopted shelter dogs, but I haven't worked in a shelter community at all. I mean, we do have several shelters, and I volunteer as far as, like, money, so I I do charitable contributions, things like that, but I haven't been involved in a shelter, like, working on them with them or volunteering. And are your shelters uh, no-kill shelters? Yes, most of them. I mean, there are kill shelters around, but the main ones here, the Humane Society and uh, Brother Wolf in particular here in town are no-kill shelters. And then we also have this small little group called Charlie's Angel- Angels Rescue. They're also a no-kill shelter. So a bunch of them are no-kill shelter, but the kill shelters do exist too. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, so let's, let's get into your book. Talk to me about your... Um are you sell, you're selling it through your website? Yes, I have a link through my website, but currently it's on Amazon, both in ebook and in paperback version. But it, by the way, it's also undergoing um, an ed- edition. It's being edited, so I'll have it updated probably within the next couple months. Got it. Got it. It's um, from a a dog trainer. I've been training for 23 years mm-hmm. and um, I, I found it fascinating. It definitely kept me reading. Um, and the, the fascinating thing um, that I found with it was um, there were points that I, uh, I felt conflicted and, um, and and I am not a swing to one side or the other trainer at all. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. At all. Um, and and I believe that 
in some way, shape, or form, it all works as long as you're working with the right owner and the right dog. To some mm-hmm. degree. Um, so we don't train in a in a bubble at all here as far as what Western States does. So, um, mm-hmm. so I found your book fascinating. Um, and, and I don't know from, um, you know, from my client base that, um, that the book makes sense, I guess is the best, is the best way from, if I'm reading it, it makes sense to me as a dog trainer. I get it. I, uh-huh. I, completely understand what um what you are saying and I completely understand what your um the point that you're trying to get across. Um but it's it, and it's definitely a good description to help people understand the different training styles. Mm-hmm. Um but and I know you said this was one of a series of books, is that correct? Right. Um right. and so you know if somebody picked up you know, that book with the intentions of of training. And we all wish from a dog trainer standpoint that, you know, education right from the get-go um, is key. If I can help you understand what we're trying to do, then training becomes much easier. Um, mm-hmm. And definitely go into um, clients' homes with the question of, oh, what do you think of Caesar Milan? Or what do you think of, you know... Or is still well, and you know, every you have to be prepared to answer those questions for sure. Um, sure. And and so I I thought that your your book was written very well um, in describing and helping understand that. Um, but what I didn't find, and, and what I thought was a little bit conflicting, was um, I guess the it, it came across as if you were bashing a little bit. And I, I yeah, and I, that's why I'm getting it edited, and I'm really sorry if no, you felt that way, and it's something that I'm trying not to do. <laughs> uh, it was just, uh, seriously, that's, that's really why I needed someone else to look at it. But, you know, early on, you don't have a huge amount of resources yep. to get it professionally edited, right. you know, and so that's why I'm having someone else look at it. And I'm really trying not to bash. I, I really didn't, but I, I guess one of the things that happens here, and I don't know how it is in Utah, mm-hmm. but if you are here as a trainer, uh, in especially Western North Carolina, mm-hmm. if you are not a positive only trainer, yeah. you really get bashed. I mean, it's, in, it's in really, uh, pardon? In what way? Uh, you get criticized, you're told that you're, you know, uh, mean, uh, unorthodox, whatever. People, one time I was sitting with this woman, we were just talking about dogs, and, you know, she knew I was a dog trainer, mm-hmm. and I mentioned how to use a prong collar the right way, and she got so upset with me, started crying, and stormed out of the party and we were just chatting and I was shocked that she took it so emotionally and earlier in the conversation you know I was just uh, explaining how dogs play with one another and how dogs play with one another isn't necessarily how humans play with one another and so that can be a little bit you know like wow that's pretty harsh and this person said that's why I don't allow my dogs to play with one another. Yeah. And I said, wow, really? Yeah, yeah. And I just found that astounding that it's not allowed. And so, there, there and all the shelters, one of the reasons that I don't really work with the shelters um, on a regular basis, and I hope this changes, is because they don't want anything but harnesses used for all dogs. You know, even a 80, 90 pound pit bull. Yeah. And that's really tough. Yeah. I'm 125 pounds and I'm no match <laughs> physically yeah. for a pit bull that's 90 pounds on a harness. Yeah. 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 It's, um, so here in Utah, it, it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, uh-huh. There's, 
I don't know that bashing. I don't. I don't feel like there's bashing here in Utah. There's some strong opinions, um, but I think it's a little bit more humbling here because um, those of us that are not all positive and not all negative, um, we have we take on a lot of their clients that are. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And maybe some of the brick and mortar. I'm, I'm not a brick and mortar facility we are custom in home training Mm -hmm. and so we're going into homes that people are finally so frustrated with them um that you know i can't do anything without food i don't know how to discipline my dog i can't get to stop getting on the counter so we do a lot of um in-home behavior stuff that a lot of the positive trainers don't necessarily specialize in um Mm -hmm. to a deep extent and so um I, I don't get it. Um, I, I think that some of the strictly shot collar trainers see more of that. Um, mm-hmm. because they, you know, they'll take your dog for two weeks, put them on an e collar, and then, right. you know, send them home. And, and sure, anybody, I think anybody can do that. Anybody can do that. Right. And you can get any dog to do that. Working off of a, of a shop collar, but I, I have used them for certain scenarios and, and um, likewise. So, but not on. I don't use them on a regular basis no, at all for no. obedience training. Nope, nope, not at all. And nor do I yeah. use it for behavioral stuff. Um, I I use it for our bird dogs here that have big open running bubbles that need a recall. Um, that you know that with our open country here and all the temptations of life, you know, wildlife that um, some of them need to be on it. And that's about the core of our, so I'm not, I'm not, I, I think because we don't swing one way or the other, we're not getting the bashing um, mm-hmm. as we do teach with food as well. Um, yeah. And I, I do also, um, as far as teaching behavioral things with a uh, electronic collars, the things that I have used, E collars for, of course, some people they cannot build fences, so they use them for uh, e fences. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of communities here that don't allow building fences, sure. uh, physical fences, because they want that open community type of um, arrangement. Yep. And then I've used it for a uh, very large Saint Bernard, who he wouldn't stop barking at other dogs. We tried everything to get him to stop barking, and we used the e-collar a few times, and he was like, okay, I get it now. I'll stop barking. And then there's another client that um, she uh, adopted a hound dog. It's a blue tick coon hound, and he, uh, he went into the shelter at four years old. He was not neutered, and he just got neutered. And I, I don't know how well you know hound dogs, but hound dogs have their own little personality. Yeah. And he keeps trying to jump out of her yard. Mm-hmm. And actually this weekend, he went up to the top of the landing to try to jump out of the yard. Mm-hmm. And so we had to use, a, you know, a combination of electric fence and electronic collar to say, stop doing that or you're going to end up in the street. Right. You know, hit by a car. I mean, it's like a life or death situation. Right. But I don't use e collars as oh, that's the go-to thing yeah. for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I do a lot of food, uh, depending on what we're doing. It, it really depends on what we're doing. Yeah, you know, this type of thing. Yeah. So it's fascinating that you're um, feeling some of that. You know, I, I know the positive trainers really go on a. I know they go on a bashing spree. Um, but well, so there's a. There's a local um, pet store here in town that has a big bowl and is wanting everybody to um, put the prong collars in there, any prong collars that they find, to put them in there and they should never be used again. And I just think that's a very sad, um, very sad statement, actually, not understanding how that collar actually works. And that's one of the things that I find one of the biggest problems in the dog training community is that particular collar. And that was one of the other points that I wrote about in that book. 
why I wanted to talk about it. And it's been a very touchy situation because, you know, when you mention the prong collar, immediately people, you know, they get that little, I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> yep. yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's, um, it, it's a, it's a, a fascinating world that's evolved from when I was training 23 years ago. Um, mm-hmm. dope collars. Um, for the longest time I used, uh, you know, I used prong collars and I'm not, I've got some dogs on them and others I don't. Um, mm-hmm. but, um, it's definitely evolved into a hard state from respecting the dog for the dog and not humanizing them. Um, right. Where we've humanized them, uh, severely. And, and it right. becomes challenging to, um, trainers that are educated enough from the mind of the dog. Um, I'm going to kind of turn some questions over to Shannon and Michelle. Um, Sure. And uh, see what questions they have about your book. Okay. Okay. I wrote them down. I'm just getting them out. <laughs> okay. Mm-hmm. Oh, I wanted... I wanted you to talk a little bit about, in your book, you talk about using the word no. And I think that Uh people have a really hard time using the word no because it's just so overused because humans are a verbal creature. They tend to talk too much to their dog. So I just wanted um, you to express for our listeners some of your ideas about how you um, use the word no in your training. Okay. Well, sure. So, um, and that was one of the things that I found uh fascinating. Like I said, I I started in 2014, and so I've been doing a lot of just observing and uh talking to folks like um, Joe had mentioned where she'll get clients who are frustrated because they've used other trainers and they just don't know what to do. And I have been told that people don't train the word no in uh, many cases, uh, you know, they'll use sounds and stuff like that, but instead of using no. And so what I, what I do is, so the, the, the way I approach training is very similar to positive discipline for children. And are you guys familiar with that? Anybody have kids yep. where you use all four quadrants of operant conditioning, but you say it nicely and oftentimes when you use the word no or off or anything like that, you tell them something, you, you stop the behavior, that's the, you know, the word punishment or the redirection or the correction, you say no, and then you say good dog if they stop doing it, so you automatically connect it with a positive, or you tell them, you know, like say they're trying to chew your slippers, and you say no, and then you give them a bone, and you say Good dog, that's what you do, kind of thing. And so I rarely have the word no in isolation. It's always, uh, you know, like stop that and let's move on to something different. Uh, same, you know, like when you're, if you have to give a correction, I, I was always taught when I'm giving a leash correction, you always combine it with a positive. So when, you know, like say you're turning and you have to, you know, they go to the end of the leash and you say, and then they turn around and start coming to you. Instead of saying, you know, no, it, when they turn around, you say, what a good dog. There you go. And so every time I've ever done a leash correction of any type, I always combine it with a positive good dog or whatever. And I, re- I never say no in those cases. Mm-hmm. I use no pretty sparingly, but I always use it in a way to stop a behavior and then connect it with what I want them to do. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't, and one of the things that I do teach, you know, because dogs don't understand English, no matter what people tell you, I mean, I know that they kind of have these, you know, ways about them, but I always explain that, uh, so I'm from the North, and uh, I know that, and, and I didn't come up with this myself. Someone else, when I was living down in Georgia, 
explain the difference between Northerners talking and Southerners talking. And so um, Northerners, like me, tend to be very clipped, curt, you know, very direct to the point. And so whenever I give uh, skill words, I, I also don't like using the word command because that just sounds too rough, but I use words, you know, like come, stop, off you know, jump, whatever, I say them kind of in a northern way. And then when I'm praising, you know, like say they, you know, we're getting up on the counter and I would say off. And then they get off the counter. And then I turn into my southern way of speaking and I drag out the, what a good dog you are. Look at you. You know, and that's when I do the cheery, talky kind of stuff. But all my other words that I use, including no, are just very direct, straight to the point. I don't dwell on those words. So my other question, I think it has to do with um, the difference between reading your book as a dog trainer and reading your book as like a, a regular everyday person, that um, I'd like you to discuss a little bit um, your definition of a pack as relating to to wolves and dogs? So my understanding of pack uh, and pack animals is from David Meech and his book on wolf biology in uh, 1970. And what I explain in my book is that uh, all that, the ideas of alpha male, alpha female, all that kind of stuff where, you know, there are only two breeding uh, a male and a female, and the younger males are challenging the older males, maybe the alpha male, to get their chance of being the breeding male, that type of thing. And that was the construct of a pack. And that's not how, when the wolves were released in 1995 in Yellowstone and then followed for three, four years, that's not the scenario that uh, wolves naturally form when they are in the wilds of uh, western United States. They form small family groups where mom and dad, and they pair up as pairs, and they have a generation or two of kids, just like we have, like humans, you know, in their household. They have their children. Sometimes they have their grandchildren or something like that. And we live in a community, but we're not necessarily packed. Like, you know, you and your, say you have you, you and your husband and five kids, let's just say. You're not called a pack. You're called a family group because you're all related. And the problem with the idea of, or what I saw was the conflict, is that many times, Half animals are not related to one another as opposed to being a family group where you have a, you know, the man, main male and female and all of the other members within that little group that hang out together are related to that male and female as being their offspring. So that's why, you know, David Mech was the person who said dogs are not half animals, they form family groups. And you know, you can, you know, like, hang out with friends and sometimes, you know, the rat pack and all that kind of stuff. They use that term as a pack. But as far as what they naturally form in the wild, at least as far as the wolves are concerned, are not packs, but family groups or extended family groups. So you're, what you're, what you're trying to, um, convey in the book is that um, the pack mentality of training where we have this alpha type behavior um, is more so um, just for you know simple understanding for our listeners is um, a pack would be more like a gang right you've got You've Absolutely. got the ones in charge, and then everybody kind of follows and, you know, submits to Absolutely. the rules of of the gang. Whereas um, with the dogs, um, we 
we've domesticated them one into our family, but also, you know, that is correct. Um, with the wolves is they, they definitely are family oriented, but we have defined them as a pack. And so therefore somehow we have to have this alpha type training behavior. So the dog understands what, what we're trying to accomplish. Correct. I guess in both cases, you know, the trainer, if you want to call him the alpha, you know, male or female, alpha individual, or they're just the parent. Yeah, they're the and leaders. So oh, he's just kind of, you know, just like mom and dad would yeah. teach their babies to do certain things. Yeah. You don't have to be the leader, dude. Um, and, you know, dogs do, you know, wild dogs, dogs that are feral, they do form packs. Yeah, they do. And that's when they get dangerous. Yep. Is, you know, they can uh, gang up and, you know, beat up neighborhood dogs or something like that. Right. And that's pretty different from their normal lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. So as far as overall, um, what what our style is here and what you're doing is very similar. And I teach people all the time, it doesn't matter if you're alpha as long as you can lead and be a a source for your dog of safety and food and, um, and the rules, um, and that we don't, um, I, I have three kids and I think probably two of them are much more alpha if we want to use that word than I am. Um, and, and I'm okay with that, right? We don't try and change our kids to be submissive to us as parents. Um, and that's how I describe it too my clients where they come in and say, I'm just not alpha enough. And I'm like, that's all right. You don't have to be. Um, and so, you know, I think that comes from, you know, one, it's very conflicting where we've humanized our dogs and it's all positive um, type training. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, we as human beings should be giving our kids candy bars for bad grades, but, um, but, in, but in the same breath, we live in a world with consequences and rules and expectations. Um, and I think that's where dog owners get hung up is, well, I can't be, quote, mean to my dog, but yet I'm not really alpha and I don't know what to do and I don't know how to do that. So um, so I, I would definitely be interested in reading um, the edited version of your book, um, uh, it's definitely, from a dog trainer standpoint, I, I understand and get what you're trying to say from a client's perspective or a dog owner's perspective. Um, it's pretty deep. It's a good deep, but it's pretty deep. Right. So my book, this first volume, is called A Philosophy Primer, and I, did, I, I wanted to make sure people understood that it wasn't a how-to book. Uh-huh. How- trying to lay the groundwork for, you know, how to sure. approach differently. And one of the things that I do think uh, clients, uh, non-trainers and trainers actually, need is a really thorough understanding of really what operant conditioning really means. Right. And I do try to explain that some, but it can get very detailed and a real yawner for, you know, a lot of people that they just, you know, they're just like, I just want to train my dog. I don't want to, psychology 101. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that one of the biggest problems that happens, uh, and, you know, it's just the nature of the beast. So when B.F. Skinner did his work, uh, it was either punishment or reinforcement because the punishment was a shock. And the food, and the reinforcement was the food, and there was absolutely no gray area area in between. Right. And they were also working with rats and pigeons in a box, yep. as opposed to in the outside world in reality. And so, and I do also know that just those terms, positive and negative, of course, positive is going to make everybody think that's good. Right. And negative means that's bad. Yep. And that has nothing to do with good or bad when you're actually talking about operant conditioning. It just means adding something or taking away something. And 
and it, you know you can put the emotional value into whatever you're adding or taking away, but it doesn't mean happiness is positive and sadness and mean is being negative. Correct. Yeah. That gets very confusing. Yeah. And that was one of the other reasons that I wanted to explain that clearly. And, you know, I, I find myself oftentimes, uh, the book actually started to, you know, I, I sit down with clients and I try to explain a different way of training, especially the folks that are frustrated and, um, you know, just explaining why I come to this approach, it was easier for me to just say, you know, you can read this and kind of understand where I'm coming from. And, you know, a number of clients have really liked reading, you know, what I'm trying to say. Because, you know, sometimes I'll be talking for 30 minutes and they kind of get a glazed look on their face. Sure, yeah. Like, you know, I'd love to be able to read this <laughs> thing. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, we, we, get, we get that as well. Um, and, and I definitely think that from a, you know, from a trainer on the ground and working with clients where you get the opportunity to one show, you know, they get to read it and then they get to see the, um, the success is an easier way to put it together versus somebody that's just looking for a resource and understanding it, but then, um, you know, definitely coming up with the how-to book um, is going to be critical, for sure. Right, yes. yes. Globally. And that's what yeah. I'm working on this summer. Got it. Along with, like, videos, because it'll be really, it's hard to read that stuff as opposed to seeing stuff, yep. you know, a yep. is worth a thousand words and a video is worth a million. Right, And especially right. in dog training, a lot of people like to imitate, you know, so it's easier yep. for them to imitate what you're doing as opposed to reading it in a book right. or trying to piece it together in a picture. Sure. Yep. Yep. So, oh, yeah. um, right. what other questions do you have? That was it. That was it. Michelle, do you have any? No, actually, the few that I had, she kind of just answered. I was going to ask about the next books, so... Nice. Yeah. Um, what questions do you have for us, Catherine? So how long have you, uh, are you guys all trainers or just part of the podcast group? And how long have you been actually training out in Utah? Um, I have been training dogs for 23 years. In Utah? In Is Utah. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um our business, Western States Canine College, has been around, this next year will be 10 years. Wow. Um, so, and I've, and I've worked in the shelter world, and I've been around the block a little bit here um, in Utah. So, um, it's definitely, uh, it's, uh, through the years, uh, dogs have definitely gotten worse. Um and and I also think with the um, no kill movement, we have um, harder behaviors um, that owners are having to face um, than than ever before. And I think that's why we're seeing more dogs in the in the shelters because we're um, we're a no kill. Um, we're we're darn near a hundred percent no kill here in Utah. So um, and we have tons and tons and tons of rescue groups um and each city has a shelter on top of the humane society here so um we're kind of in full full bloom of behavior um here um we also i don't know in north carolina um or you know where you're at if you you know the dog parks we have dog parks we have tons of off-leash stuff here and um we have tons of doggy daycare um type scenarios here that definitely play into behavior of dogs and their relationship with their owners. So um, I think over the years it's gotten more challenging for owners to own dogs. Because of the behaviors that the dogs have or why is it more challenging? Um, because it's the it's the thing to do to send your dog into um, you know, and I'll and I will call it a pack, right? We're sending our dogs into doggy daycare, and they're learning to really be a dog. <laughs> and, 
And so you, and you that's know, totally, that's totally is a past situation. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah, not for sure. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, then we come into, you know, coming back into the family life. Um, it drives people to continue to take their dogs into doggy daycare um, more and more because, well, they come home tired. Right. Because they can't adapt back into family life. I was going to say, do you think that by taking them to doggy daycare on a regular basis, that's creating Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Behaviors? Yeah. Yep. Interesting. Okay. You know, I, that's interesting because I wasn't really connecting that. Um, but that's a really good point. And what is the atmosphere, climate out there as far as, um, so you, are you familiar with Toronto banning all types of uh, aversive types of uh, training equipment? Yep. Uh, collars, choke collars, yep. cross collars. Yep. Is that happening in Utah with What's the climate there? I mean, what what do you think? You know, so we have this explosion of dogs and no-kill shelters and frustrated clients and the banning of uh, certain equipment. Well, I think it's a reflection of the overall society in general. Um, we're not. There's not anything that's banning here at all. I mean, people... People, you know, no problem. I picked up a dog for board and train, and you know, out came the prong collar and the, um, and she's like, "This is what we have to use," but he's not really responsive to. Him. I'm like, "That's okay. We'll get him there." So it's not really, um, it, the what funny is the prong collar tends to be um, the go-to after people have gone through positive and they can't really. Um, and I'm not bashing positive because I think they lay a great foundation. Um, it just oh, I agree. that's where it goes, but. Um, you know, then they then we jump to the prong collar because that's the only way we we can get them to behave with rules, which um, which is fine too. But there's not any culturally here. It's not nobody's banning anything. We've got a we've got a lot of e collar trainers. Um, we have I think our positive reinforcement group of people here are actually smaller than the rest. Wow! Yeah, that's very different from here. <laughs> And, and our shelters, I mean, the trainers in our shelters are all positive, um, but they don't, um, they don't send you out the door saying this is what you should train with. Um, so it's, it's definitely a different culture, for sure. Um, as far as the staff goes, um, Michelle, um, who's kind of in the background here, she's, she's our core, she's one of our core trainers. Um, uh-huh. and then Shannon does our, um, I don't know, I don't want to downplay this, but she does kind of our easier dog walks that after we set them straight, she kind of maintains for us for some of our clients. Um, instead uh-huh. of hiring dog walkers, they just keep us on board and help maintain their dog, um, for them. And then Shannon does all the technical side of our business and our online dog training platform. Awesome. And um, my husband's kind of the IT guy and behind the scenes. And the photographer. The guy that we get to yell at. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's our that's our core um, our core group here. Mm-hmm. Well, I do know I I belong to this um, Facebook group with trainers. And I know that there are certain parts of the country that people are really sweating it as far as the movement of trying to ban equipment, uh, training equipment, which I find amazing in the sense that, um, you know, we pay really good money to go to the dentist, to have things put on our teeth, put on, you know, like, Grills and stuff like that. Right. Yep. If that stuff is used incorrectly, I mean, first of all, just getting your tooth drilled by a dentist, <laughs> right? Or, and, you know, getting the shots and stuff like that. But you know, those tools can definitely be used to really torture someone. But we pay good money, trusting these folks to use the equipment properly. But 
there's this group of, you know, here we are dog trainers, and there's like the hatchet coming down saying, you may not use any of that stuff, even if you're good at it. And that's the problem that I, there's such a disconnect there. I don't understand that, that, you know, we send our kids and ourselves to the dentist to undergo these things, but then, you know, someone who's a qualified trainer, they're just going to take away some of their tools, even though some people don't understand that. Right, right. I, I think some of the hard pieces is, is that I can find hundreds of YouTube videos with harnesses and head collars used in a very mean way that I'm appalled at. Um, so, and I think that's just the overall culture of society that we put on our rose colored glasses. And, um, and that's where we sit. And so therefore, if something sounds mean, then we shouldn't do it. And, um, I think it's, uh, you know, for me, I just feel like it's the overall culture of the meanness that is happening in society overall. So, you know, we're, we're going to pick on and bash on um, anybody that doesn't have the same beliefs that we have. Right. So. And by the way, the, in my book, did not mean to bash on anybody. So I'm not a creative writer. <laughs> I write as a scientist, yeah. and I have a little bit of a um, attorney type of writing yeah. in me. Yeah. So I always feel like I'm presenting a case sure. and making my point. Yeah. And it, that's kind of how it came out, and that's why I got this editor to soften it up. Yeah. And I do not mean any disrespect to anybody, and I do find a lot of positive from other trainers. It was just, you know, I guess I was kind of coming from a place of, you know, nobody understands this, and I'm just saying that this stuff is okay. Yeah. You know, it's not evil. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so hopefully in the updated version, it won't seem like that. <laughs> but I was, like I said, I'm a very dry writer, and if anything, I kind of felt like I was presenting a, a, a an oral brief or a written sure. brief of I, you know, this is okay to train. Right? Yep, yep. And, um, yeah, I can tell you're very passionate about what you do. And I, I think and that's I, fabulous. And I, I, I mean, the, the one thing, I absolutely love being able to, you know, I do get, reject clients, you know, that they've gone to several other clients, uh, several, several other uh, trainers, and they're, I've had several say, this is it. If I can't get this dog trained, yeah. I'm going to surrender them. Yeah. Or I just adopted this dog, and I think I have to take them back, and it's been taken back twice before. And when you can make changes in these lives, and they're just like, wow, I can't believe it. I, I I actually have a client, one of my first clients I worked with, and she has a, it's like a Malamute pit bull mix who has those blue glass eyes. Yep. I mean, just a crazy looking dog, and huh. he was afraid of him. And so the first time I went in, you know, I had to work with her to be able to pick up a bone when he's looking yeah. at her, yeah. or pick up a dog bone. Anyway, uh, fast forward two years later, she was with her two dogs, including him, walking at the local dog park, and someone stopped her and said, are you a professional trainer? And she just started laughing, and she goes, no, but I have one that you can use, and this dog adores her. I mean, all, she comes to my group sessions now, uh -huh. and he can't dive off of her, and, you know, now they're so bonded, and just to be able to make that type of difference for someone where they're like on the fence, I think I have to give him up because I can't handle him. To, sure. Wow, the dog loves me. Yeah. It, it's just so satisfying, and that's what is driving me to stay in this particular field. I really love it. That's great. That's great. Do you feel uh, business is good and successful and life's going good? Yes, great? and it's getting better and better. You know, I good. made it through those first two years, <laughs> kind of tough years, and you know, I've been teaching along with training. I'm not full-time yet, okay. but I'm, by the end of this year, I can 
you know, stop doing, I, I adjunct teach, uh, typically anatomy and physiology, human anatomy and physiology. Okay. Uh-huh. And I'm thinking I can, you know, leave the academic adjunct world behind and just be able to focus on dog training. Good for you. It's yeah. a journey. It is, and it's a fun journey. It's fun <laughs> for like you guys. And I'm really, really, you know, I'm very thankful for that, and I love connecting. I, I mean, how would I ever connect with a trainer in Utah? Right. You know, yep. I love the social media aspect of it, and yep. it's so fun that dogs, you know, lots of people like to look at dog pictures. Yes, they and do. that's what makes it really fun. Yep, for sure. For sure. They do love their dogs. And, you know, you know, I teach anatomy and physiology, and I also teach nutrition. And, you know, I know how healthy it is to have a really good relationship with not only a human, but an animal. Yeah. And so that's the part. Maybe I'm not so good as, you know, with the relationship with people. But <laughs> you can help with that relationship with your dog, and then they give you so much back yeah, without sure. even asking. But it's just getting them to be a user-friendly dog. And yeah. that's my goal, to help everybody get a user-friendly dog. That's great. That's awesome. Do you have any other questions yeah. for us? I uh, I don't think so. This has been really fun. It's been fabulous. And when we um, were ahead... Um, on our podcast. So when we um, post it and go live with it, I will definitely let uh-huh. you know and just share it out there. It's been it's been fabulous talking with you. And um, Likewise. we look forward to other books and having you on the show more. Awesome. And I appreciate it. And yes, you can give me a little pass on that bashing people, which I didn't mean to do. <laughs> I, I'm a bit of a writer in that way. No, it's good. So, Catherine, if you'll just give us your full name and the name of your book so we can put it out there yes. for you. So, my full name is Catherine, K-A-T-H-R-Y-N, and I usually use my middle initial R for, like, official things, so it's Catherine R, and then my last name is spelled G as in George, U, B as in boy, I, S, T, A. And the name okay. of your book? It's called The Dog's Perspective, colon, How to Train a Dog by Thinking Like a Dog. Perfect. That's going to be the name of the series and then this particular volume. And like I said, I don't know if my editor is going to want to change the volume. He likes the series name, but he wasn't certain about the volume name. Sure. Currently, it's called A Philosophy Primer. I just wanted people to know that it's philosophical. Yeah. Yep, for sure. For sure. There's no app two in there, really. Yeah. No, that's great. Okay. Thank you. That Pleasure is... to talk with you. Yeah, it's wonderful to talk to you guys, too. And I guess I'll see you on social media. Yeah, stay in touch. All right, likewise. Bye-bye. Bye. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. If you want to know more about us and our services, please visit our website at www wsk9co.com. And as always, we urge you to get out and train.